Hi, APE students. Um, I miss you so much. I hope you're doing well. Um, we're going to wrap up our energy unit this week. Um, so you have the biomass um, lecture to watch and follow along with. And then you also, I'll post one on transportation fuels. Remember, energy is still assessed on our exam. So you really got to make sure you stick with it through the rest of this unit and the next one. Um, we'll kind of take it easy in that air pollution unit. Um, and again, even for this unit, I'm reducing the number of multiple choice. Should be pretty straightforward. Um, you may have gotten an email from the College Board. I also posted a message on Canvas that the College Board is starting live um, um, tutorial review sessions starting tomorrow um, at 12 o'clock our time. Um, you can always watch them later on YouTube. And even though um, the videos are, are going to cover, the sessions are going to cover units eight and nine that we're not being assessed on, there's going to be a lot of spiraling and linking back to previous content um, and just a review of the science practices and skills. Um, so check those out and uh, let's talk about renewable energy biomass. So we've talked about this in terms of deforestation and people in the developing world using biomass. It's just as um, living plant material um, in order to supply their energy needs. Um, these are a few of the other concepts that we're going to take a look at um, throughout the rest of the unit. Oh, remember, you still have your energy um, flowchart. It's been a long time. Um, and you should be filling that part in on biomass. So you make sure that you get the nitty gritty of like how we get biomass fuels, but certainly the advantages and disadvantages of it. OK, so we got to back up a little bit and um, we have to we're going to look at where the ethanol comes from. We hear about like gasohol or ethanol for bio from biofuels um, and the ethanol ultimately comes from glucose. So to kind of keep this all straight, we have to just review where the glucose came from. So remember that is those sugars are a product of photosynthesis. I have inorganic carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It combines with water vapor and I form these amazing sugar molecules and oxygen. Um, I take that sugar then and I ferment that. Yeast are able to um, break that sugar down. Um, and in the process of doing that, they create ethanol and carbon dioxide. Um, so they have both the word and the chemical equation there. Um, most um, biofuel, most ethanol for biofuel in the United States comes from corn. Um, Brazil uses a lot of sugarcane because that's what they grow. That idea of using a locally grown feedstock um, for getting my ethanol product is going to become um, super important here in a little bit. Um, and so if you think of it, if we're growing corn, like right away I've got of some problems when I look at net energy and the entire energy fuel cycle because we should be using really fertile farmland for growing food for people, not filling, fulfilling our energy needs. Um, there are so many inputs that go into producing that corn that net energy wise, there's very little left. Um, corn, ethanol from corn has been a really great um, biofuel to get us started down the path. Um, there are a really exciting areas of biochemistry um, that I'll share with you in a little bit at the end here um, that are kind of moving us towards a more sustainable um, type of biofuel. So one of those is switchgrass. Um, it's what, switchgrass is what we call a perennial crop. And the video link from the Switch Energy Project that I will share with you at the end talks about that idea, um, inherent advantages of a perennial crop. Um, I don't plant it, it grows back year after year. And I can harvest the same crop for a long period of time. Many of these um, perennial crops um, have other advantages is that they grow on what we would call marginal cropland. So cropland that we probably, or, or land that we wouldn't probably have in like a high yield corn or soy production anyway, because um, they just don't get that kind of yield from that marginal cropland. Um, they often grow in um, kind of cold, wet climate. So again, areas that I maybe, that wouldn't be prime farmland for growing um, more food crops. Um, so it's in many ways an excellent candidate. And again, the, there's just a lot of really exciting research happening um, to see what we can do with these perennial crops. 
So here's the deal, and I'm going to jump ahead for just a second and show you this picture of cellulose. So when I look at um, ethanol from corn, and remember to get that ethanol, I started with glucose. Well, that glucose is really abundant as a simple sugar in the kernel of the corn, but most of the corn plant, I mean, obviously corn isn't switchgrass, but even if I'm looking at where the corn cobs are, um, there's just a lot of other um, stock of the of the corn plant um, that isn't a simple sugar that I can't readily produce alcohol from. And so one of the challenges of this biofuel research is finding a way to take cellulosic material. This is the, the stock, the hard structural component um, of the um, plant. And like, remember when we tested food and we tested for starch and we said, oh, that's a complex sugar. And um, I get a nice energy yield out of that. I don't, my body doesn't assimilate it um, as quickly as glucose because I still have to break it down a little bit. But remember, we can't eat cellulose because we don't have enzymes. There's just, these are all glucose molecules. I just have to get the linkages that hold all the glucose molecules together in that polysaccharide. I have to have an enzyme that will break that linkage. And when you take biochemistry in college, you'll learn about alpha and beta linkages. And you can just kind of inherently see that this is like an up sort of linkage and this linkage off this off of this carbon of this point in the sugar is kind of down. So I get kind of just a different chain. It looks a little bit different. And we have the kind of enzymes, our, we create enzymes that can break these linkages. Cows ha have symbiotic bacteria, uh, microbes in their gut, just like termites have symbiotic microbes in their gut that can break these beta linkages. They have the enzymes that can break these beta linkages. So that's why they can break down cellulose. So the bottom line is if we could find a way um, a lot of the ethanol or biofuel research is to be able to get this ethanol product, not just out of simple sugars, but out of that cellulose. So I've, I can do it, like we could do this in the lab, like, and we would have um, had done some testing of that had we still been in school, but to scale that up, I think as you're seeing for any renewable energy, we just need to keep pushing on that research and development and we keep getting better and better and are able to scale that up larger and larger so that it becomes um, efficient so that my net energy um, has a I have a good net energy yield again right now with corn I have a low net energy yield because of all the inputs needed to produce the corn to begin with um, so what happens after um oh some other sources we could look for then this is a really big exciting area of research research is what we would call microalgae um and it's there's just a diagram here you can show how the um the process of breaking down um the um, algae cell in order to get the um, lipids out of there to get the fat molecules out of there just like we have corn oil and things like that so that's a pretty exciting um, field of research um, here's the one of the biggest misconceptions and problems that students have when they write about um, things like this on the national exam is that like the question will say um, like almost justify a claim or something that um, biofuels produce no carbon dioxide. Well, um, you have to understand that technically they don't, but I still have to burn that ethanol that I create. So this is the chemical formula for ethanol. I think we had it drawn out like um, in its molecular structure here. Oh, no, we didn't. Um, but this is just two carbons with five hydrogens hooked around that. And I've got this alcohol or OH group um, that I would have at the end of that. And it still is just like any other hydrocarbon as far as I'm concerned in terms of putting it in my car engine and, and combusting it in my internal combustion engine is that I still have to oxidize that. I still have a combustion reaction of my ethanol and all combustion hydrocarbon combustion processes produce carbon dioxide. The deal is that this is the same molecule of carbon dioxide that that plant 
just took out of the atmosphere during photosynthesis, right? So I'm taking this molecule of carbon dioxide after I burn my um, ethanol, I put my ethanol into a combustion reaction, and I'm taking that same molecule of carbon dioxide that that algae, that that um, switchgrass, that that corn, that that sugarcane, that plant had just taken out a molecule of carbon dioxide and I am putting that same carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So it's what we call carbon neutral. And it's how I would really summarize the benefits of biofuels is that it's new carbon versus old carbon. We know that old carbon is upsetting the natural balance of where carbon is stored or sequestered um, on our planet. Um, and so this idea of carbon neutral. Um, I just want to do, oh, this is the um, biofuel lab we were going to do. We were going to look for evidence of cellulosic enzyme activity. Um, but there is a link here to the switch energy thing on biofuels. It's a four minute video, really exciting um, fields of research. And there's a lot that goes on at UW-Madison. Hey, see you tomorrow, guys. Love ya.